thank you yes. for all coming this strange time of year. We're in this uh, little, uh, I know this strange time of year when the students are not much around, but uh, uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Birar Swain uh, to speak this afternoon. We've been trying to get her here to JGU for some time. Um, she's an old friend of many of us here. Professor Sebastian has been old and myself known her for, for years. And uh, it's been hard to get her. She's a busy person. You've probably seen the, uh, the, the, the blurb that we sent around. She's currently uh, just begun a period as one very prestigious fellowship as a, at the International Center for Journalists in Washington, D.C. But it's hard to introduce because you're a woman who wears many hats, right? Um, has worked in development consultancy, in media, and uh, journalism related issues. You can often catch your broadcasts and podcasts, presumably, on what? News Laundry is your usual. Where do you, where do you Rajasabha TV, News Laundry, look sometimes out, so on Wire. Look out for her, and I'm sure you're on YouTube. A lot of your things are on YouTube, that you can uh, find her uh, quite easily, and you'll find very stimulating interviews and issues raised with a, a variety of public and intellectual figures. Uh, so today she's going to address us on something very topical, uh, on the global refugee crisis in the new lexicon. So, thank you, Viraj. Can I say a word? Okay. Would you like to press the session? Yes, I'd like to say a word, actually, um, which is to say that um, since becoming the dean of uh, the School of Government and Public Policy in 2012 here, I've done the school a disservice by not having Viraj way come um, more often and earlier. Um, honestly speaking, if I were to name uh, one person whose works, I would say, uh, required reading for students of public policy, just like it, uh, it would be her. Um, you know, she's just done a marvelous series um, uh, on global summits, you know, which is something as someone who's worked for so many years in the United Nations Development Program and all of this NDGs and SDGs and so on. Um, very, very insightful, clear, scintillating analysis of uh, many global summits. Um, you know, practically every subject, really. I mean, you know, we had the <coughs> Food Security Act that was passed uh, while that was in Parliament. Yeah, she produced a, a monograph for IBS in Sussex, uh, along with some other uh, good friends, um, you know, C.P. Chandrasekhar, Harsh uh, people like that, on uh, food security. She did a marvelous piece for UNICEF on um, food security uh, for tribal children, and there's no malnourishment is India's uh, you know, s shameful problem, as Manmohan Singh called it, but did not do very much about it, having called it shameful. Um, so for all of these reasons, and, and on this topic, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, sometime back, um, you know, uh, it, this is not the first time we, we are saying we'll uh, send back the Rohingyas in 2012, uh, there was an influx again um, on account of what the Myanmar army did in the Rakhine province, um, and <coughs> we had waves of uh, migrants, um, and, and she had a, a, a very powerfully argued piece uh, as to why, if India wants to uh, regard itself as a candidate for a permanent membership of the Security Council, it must be a good member to begin with of the United Nations, and in India has not signed any of the conventions on refugees, with the result everyone who comes to this country um, is uh, you know, at the mercy of uh, the district administration, which may choose to regard them as illegal aliens and evict them uh, uh, if they so wish, because there's no real legal guarantee for any refugee, in fact, including the Tibetans, uh, who've been here since 1959. Um, so in all of these areas, as I say, um, you know, uh, I say all this only to say, well, I, I, I follow Viraj's work, but uh, I am remiss in not having her come more often um, to stimulate um, all of you. And so I hope this would be uh, the first of a number of such visits, and uh, we hope to have interactions with you and our students um, for the benefit. Um, and, you know, as you know, you are a natural teacher, um, and uh, have been taught in very many universities. So we want you to come again and again. Thank you. 
Thank you. That was really kind, <laughs> Professor Sudarshan and John. And um, actually, Sudarshan has a reputation. He, I think he's also pretty much a polymath, works in the intersection of uh, international development academia. So I'm a pretend polymath, works in the intersection of media, academia, and international development. So I presume this room is full of polymaths. So my name is Birad Swain. No relationship to H1N1 virus. My parents did not spread the swine flu. It's S-W-A-I-N, not S-W-I-N-E, okay? Um, why am I talking about this topic and why should you listen? Is because way before the Indian media started hyperventilating on the refugee issue for all the wrong reasons, like Professor Sudarshan said, I wrote three long pieces, deep dive pieces, on why Indian media needs to engage with this topic for all the right reasons last year, as part of which I got a grant to also go to various universities and talk about the refugee crisis, from journalism schools to law schools. So the, and I was also somebody who was there in the first UN refugee conference uh, conference for Refugees and Migrants last year, hosted by Barack Obama, the last thing he did before Trump took over. So I think that's one of the reasons why you should be listening to me and why my legitimacy to talk about the topic. I wanted to give Indranil a shout out because he was in my show last week on uh, public finance budgeting for nutrition in the era of Note Bandi and GST. I didn't give him a lot of talking time. So I've promised to get him back. But if he doesn't show up in my lecture today, he's definitely not getting an invitation back. <laughs> so um, uh, numbers, according to the International Organization of Migration, there are 65 million. I need you, I need you to let this number sink in. 65 million <coughs> refugees. The 6.5 crores, and these are undercounting. Always remember, most of the numbers in international arena, most of the time, would be conservative estimates. Um, according to the International Organization of Migration, again, there are 232 million international migrants, which would mean people fleeing poverty, starvation, students, people migrating for family reasons, for a better life, and what have you. Um, the El Dorado, the search for the El Dorado. But the biggest number is 746 million are internal migrants, a number which is never banded around, a discussion which we should be having. In India, according to the 2001 census, 307 million people, that's 31 crores, are self-reported mi migrants, internal migrants, who've traveled more than 2,000 kilometers for a living. So that means Sudarshan, that means Vinod, that means me, practically a lot of us people in this room who'd have traveled more than 2,000 kilometers from their place of birth to the place of work. If these numbers are not good enough reason for all of us to engage in this topic, then nothing ever will be. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is obscene inequality. So after the uh, first ever UN conference on refugees and migrants last year, Oxfam came out with a, uh, um, with a reactive statement. The six richest countries in the world, that's US, China, China is the second largest economy, not Japan, US, China, Japan, UK, France, Germany. Germany is fourth, actually. Uh, UK is fifth, and France is sixth. Between the six largest economies, they have 57% of the global wealth, but they take less than 9% of the global refugees. The six countries with less than 2% of the global wealth take 51% of the refugees, and that's Iraq, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, South Africa, and the AFPAC, the Pakistan region mostly. So these six countries have less than 2% of the global wealth and they take more than 51% of the refugees vis-a-vis. -vis. So you know that cliched Hindi cinema dialogue ki gariboon ka dil bahut achha hota It actually is right. It holds true in terms of humanity and the humanity displayed by countries which are far more poorer than the countries which are way more richer. 
uh, some important dates that you should remember is on August 20, and this is how I got it interested in the topic. In, on August 20, 2015, Barry Malone, the digital editor of Al Jazeera, wrote a brilliant, angry, angsty, stinging piece called Henceforth Al Jazeera Will Not Use the Word Migrants. It is no more fit for purpose. It generates hate, it others human beings, it debases and dehumanizes, it takes away agency, strips people of their suffering, the narrative is toxic and it's hate mongering, which is why with immediate effect Al Jazeera stopped using the word migrant. It's been two years, six months hence, Barry Malone wrote the first ever public piece and they continue to not use the word migrant. They use refugees, families and people. They do not use the word migrants. Um, September 2, 2015 is when the Syrian child Aylan Kurdi, two-year-old Syrian child, whose body washed up on the shores of Greek island Lesbos, which was a pivotal turning point in the public opinion, the European public opinion of being self-preservative, border control, not letting refugees and human beings seen. So if Napalm, what the, the, the uh, girl, the Napalm girl's photograph did to the Vietnam War, public discourse on the v Vietnam War, and the American public discourse, the American public perception of the legitimacy or illegitimacy of the Vietnam War is exactly what Alain Kurdi's photograph did to the European perception of the refugee crisis and the legitimacy or illegitimacy of border control, which is why that particular date and that particular photograph are pivotal in human history. The next important date is September 19. On this first ever, uh, uh, September 19, 2016, so last year, uh, the 71st UN General Assembly, so the UN, since you have many ex-UN staffers, you have Sudarshan, you have John. So um, the first ever UN uh, uh, General Assembly had the first ever UN conference on refugees and migrants. That was September 19. On September 20th, Barack Obama hosted a conference called Pledge to Play Summit. So anybody who's aspiring to be either getting into international diplomacy or into UN job or international development, always remember Pledge to Play is very important because one summit is where pious sentiments are made, generic statements are made, no work gets done. It's a show. It's like you know window dressing. It's the reception area. The second summit is where money is pledged. So the pledge to play is basically where money is pledged. And on 20th of September 2016, last year, $4.5 billion uh, were pledged to the refugee crisis. Uh, the next important date is 13th of October, when the Supreme Court in India started hearing the Rohingya debate, which is being represented by Prashant Bhushan, Colleen Gonzalez, Kapil Sibyl, uh, Salman Khurshid, and Fali Nariman. So the first representation by this battery of eminent lawyers was made by Fali Nariman. This next important date is exactly a week later, so any of you who's actually interested I think you should be queuing up and asking for passes to attend the next hearing on 21st of November when the Supreme Court is going to be hearing the Rohingya case in great detail. So nothing could be more topical than this point of time. So uh, let's begin from the beginning. How many of you have read or heard of a guy called Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion? You have? <laughs> so Richard Dawkins is a rationalist, is one of these eminent rock star uh, if if uh, um, uh, what All India Bakcho is to comedy, Richard Dawkins or, or John Oliver is to comedy, Richard Dawkins is to rationalism and public discourse and ration, intersection of public discourse and rationality. He says all of us are migrants. Why? Because humanity started in East Africa, in a far region in the Danadol Depression. The oldest hominid skeleton found in the world is Lucy which is 4.8 million years old. So that's where humanity started. So all of us have an atavistic connection to East Africa. All of us have migrated. So if you're sitting in Delhi, we are migrants. If you're sitting in Sonipat, we are migrants. If you're sitting in London, we are migrants. So we do not get a moral high ground to talk about who's an insider, who's a migrant, because practically the whole world, except for the East African scene in East Africa, the whole fucking world is migrants, OK? <laughs> 
Um, and he also says when people and commodities and finances can move, especially high, high net worth professionals can move, what is this, uh, this whole uh, ratcheted revulsion to people in distress moving? You do not red flag when high net worth professionals move. You do not red flag. We would not be having Panama Papers and Paradise Papers if finances could not move. <laughs> Thought experiment, right? If finances can move so seamlessly, then what is so <coughs> obscene about human beings in distress moving? That's Richard Dawkins' take. And I think that's a brilliant entry point to any conversation around refugees and migrant issue. Because that's like the, the, the Jesus Christ of, uh, sorry, he's a God delusion, so he would not like <laughs> Jesus Christ comparison. But that's like the rock star of rationalism saying that, you know, how irrational, hypocritical, and obscene any amount of border control conversation is, especially when all of us, all the 7.3 billion population of the world is a migrant, yeah? Uh, and, always, and he also says, I don't know actually he says or I say, and I pretend that he said because it sounds much more gray <laughs> when, he, when at, I attribute to him. But one of my favorite lines that I use a lot in my article that Sudarshan is saying is, always remember, heart shrink first, border shrink later. So before border shrink, you will see the narrative that will be built around othering, alienation, inhumanization, terrorization. Those are nothing but tools to make your heart shrink. So always remember, border control is just the end point manifestation of a symptom. It's the crescendo. If you have any understanding of opera music, it's the crescendo. It builds up with your heart shrinking, with a narrative being built. And if we are not red flagging all those processes, then waking up to the end manifestation is a little too uh, late. Yeah? It's a little meh situation. So um, after Barry Malone red flagged in 2015, August 20, that he, uh, so you can Google Barry Malone. Uh, or you can, uh, I have to give citations, right, Sudarshan just said. So you, you, really, you just need to read uh, my three articles. They have embedded all the uh, references that I'm going to be giving you right now. Uh, one second. Yeah, it's a, it's a place of learning, so citations count. Even though I think a stand-up comedian's uh, citation is way more powerful. So my first article is, What's in a Name? Refugees, migrants, or immigrants. That's the first one, which has Barry Malone's article embedded. What's in the name? Uh, semicolon. Refugees, migrants, or immigrants? Question mark. All of them are in news laundry. Yeah. The second one is: Did you know UNGA deliberated on the refugee crisis? Uh, that was in September, right after the UNGA conference happened. Um, the third one is why India needs a comprehensive refugee law. Yeah, I think you'll get all the citations and all the uh, um, readings that you need from these three pieces. <coughs> so after Barry Malone started, kick-started the conversation, BBC weighed in, NPR, National Public Radio, which is an extremely influential public broadcast and public podcast platform, they weighed in. Uh, Uh, Guardian weighed in, um, migrants result re and resettlement watch that say right wing, it's very, um, it's a fake news post-truth site which calls itself migrants and resettlement watch but it's actually more of a border control uh, ideology uh, platform they weighed in and the migrants right network weighed in. So Guardian started uh, an explainer right after Barry Malone's article, where they broke down the words refugees. So these are the key words every time you get into this conversation. Refugees, migrants, immigrants, asylum seekers, aliens, and dreamers. So refugees, as per the 1951 convention, and the 1967 protocol, and the status of refugees, and the 1954 UN convention on statelessness, and again, 1961 UN Convention on Reduction of Statelessness and the latest 2016 U New York Declaration basically means a human being or a people or a set of human beings who are fleeing 
a life threatening condition either for their political belief or their ethnic minority status or civil war from imminent danger to life and liberty and they go they want they're seeking as a, so these are not watertight divisions these words are seamlessly interconnected so they they're fleeing a a so short conditions of death and they they're fleeing to a destination where they think they will be secure or their life and liberty will be secure so that's what the refugee definition means migrant is someone who will have both economic considerations but also considerations again for something like uh, not exactly by war and civil war but could also be trying to escape starvation poverty extreme poverty uh, or in unstable countries also that's migrant immigrant is when you cross over to another country so it's a bit of a non starter for example let's say the source point is syria iraq libya so maghreb africa which is the north africa africa is divided into four parts the arab africa is maghreb the second part is sahel the uh, the uh, uh, hungriest and the poorest part is hekka hornest in central africa that's a place where i have worked then the uh, the most um, uh, prosperous or developing part is sadik southern african developing countries so maghreb sahel and hekka and then sadik so right now maximum refugee outflow is happening from six countries three from maghreb africa that is iraq libya and syria two from east africa or hekka that is eritrea and somalia and one is pakistan we are not counting the rohingya numbers because the rohingya numbers are pretty recent and they still i mean they will they still are not at the scale as at these numbers but in terms of intensity of the persecution the rohingyas are probably at par or even worse than this the, the kind of uh, intensity of persecution that these six countries refugees are facing so so i think one of the irony the, the sad irony is if a family in a rubber dinghy boat is trying to cross over migrate from maghreb africa through the mediterranean to italy and the boat capsizes and all the 500 people die so these are one b immigrants who were gobbled up by the sea so there is no immigrant there were migrants who left a country but there is no immigrant at the end point because they never reached the destination that's the i'm still getting goose flesh so that's the reality a lot lot of these people face or these are people who are intercepted and held up the the dichotomy is between the greek island of lesbos which has shown tremendous humanity think of the cradle of democracy which got its democracy appended 2 years ago by the greed of german banks and the greed of european union investment hedge funders when their democratic mandate was tried to be renegotiated with um, bank loans restructuring of debt and imf um, terms and the european union terms and the german bank greed this country in the in the in the throes of debt crisis is showing so much of humanity and lesbos has taken so much of refugees whereas lampedusa the italian island is a holding point it's it's a place where a lot of unaccompanied minors children are also held back there is absolutely no logical reason why children should be held back why children should be arrested or separated from their families so um, the same thing we keep seeing in australia in the pacific island of nauru and <laughs> papua new guinea also um, so migrants immigrants and then the next important term is asylum seeker people refugees who come and who are seeking asylum um then the next important term is alien which is something the us so this is us exceptionalism at its worst they use a term called aliens which is like as if we belong to another solar system another planet yes. anybody who is a non citizen is 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 an alien and they have the alien tort act a lot of you would be from the law school so you know they do have an alien tort act Barack and this is the hypocrisy of Obama also I know he can be a poster boy to many liberals but he's also somebody who unfortunately pretended to be liberal and reinforced a lot of this absurdist policies from not closing Guantanamo to many thing else and one of the things he did is this word play this cynical word play he introduced a new term called dreamers because 
America is the land of melting pot, the land of dream. But even he himself never used that word dreamers. Huh? So it's like, you know, using, it's like our prime minister calling disabled people divyang. Ab naam badalne se kya ukhaad loge? This is, you know, it's like taking the attention away from the agenda and just putting, sorry, they're recording it, so I presume this is a private university. You cannot have me rant like that. So yeah, the point is, you know, a lot of times it is just attention diverting when you're doing wordplay rather than so wordplay cuts both ways one is i think john oliver did a brilliant piece last sunday how many of you have seen it on trump presidency so he says that there's a textbook playbook um uh, approach of trump one is first is uh, uh, attack the credibility of the media second is what about re? and third is uh, trolling i think uh, wordplay is actually cuts across all the three. So wordplay can do a lot of hate mongering, can do massive amount of othering and alienation, can also completely distract from the real issues. So putting a new term like dreamers doesn't take away from the fact that US is also one of the country which is accused of deporting maximum refugees from or, or immigrants or wannabe immigrants from Central American countries where conflict is fostered by US intervention itself. And US is also one of the countries which is accused of again separating unaccompanied minors from their families, children from their family. So to come with this very fancy term dreamers and not do anything on the ground is again pious words and cognitive dissonance, the difference between practice and speech, which we see a lot. So that was Guardian's uh, uh, explainer. Um, so Guardian also during the explainer did editor editorialize and called out the hypocrisy of US. Then independent weighed in the thought that um, Al Jazeera's call to completely abandon and ban the word migrant and just stick to refugees, people and families a brilliant decision and everybody else should do it. So independent continues to use the word like Al Jazeera, refugees, people and migrant uh, and, and families but no migrants. BBC uses the word migrant, but they now qualify it with desperate journeys. Um, NPR, National Public Radio, uses the word migrant, but they now use qualifiers of action rather than identity. Uh, the Migration and Resettlement Watch thought Al Jazeera was putting out, putting, it was Al Jazeera's dog whistle, it was putting out a diktat, and it was their job to not uh, comply. But Migrant and Resettlement Watch is, somebody said that he's, she's from, she's the, she stayed in pa France, yeah. So Marie Le Pay is one of the leading icons of Migrant and Resettlement Watch. That leaves nothing to imagination when you have people like Teresa May, Marie Le Pay, or um, David Cameron sort of being the leading lights of any conversation. So, um, but my favorite, uh, intervention was by a woman called Judith Von Berg in Migrants Rights Network, where she said that while using the word refugees and using qualifiers like desperate journeys and suffering is important, it's also important to reclaim the word migrant and humanize the word migrant. And we saw a brilliant example of that last year when Justin Trudeau, the Canadian president, uh, offered to apologize to the Sikhs for the Komagata Maru incident 102 years ago when the Sikhs were not allowed to land in Canada and they were on a sheer technicality because the ship did not leave from India undocked. It docked in Japan and then it went to Canada and hence they were not allowed, they were deported and they were intercepted by the British colonial army and 19 people were shot dead before they could even get off board in Calcutta. He apologized. So that was Justin Trudeau's response to the entire conversation and lexicon and to say that <clears throat> it is important to recognize that it is in fundamental human spirit to migrate for a better life, to dream of a better world and to withhold that, to um, deny people of that like Canada did 102 years ago is wrong in multiple ways and inhuman in multiple ways. So Judith von 
Berg makes the same argument, saying that instead of being apologetic about the English word migrant, we should be humanizing it and reclaiming it. While what Al Jazeera is doing is important, but we should not be acceding defeat to the hate mongering and the othering and alienation that happens with the way mainstream media is using the word migrants, as if they're all economic opportunists, but also humanize the word migrant and reclaim it. So I think this is a brilliant debate that happened. And it is absolutely ironical that in a country which has 830 newspapers, we have the uh, 830 24-7 news channels. We have the largest per capita penetration of 24-7 news channels in the entire world, OK? As per the press in National Press Day, we have 830 24-7 news channels, including English, Hindi, and all the regional press. We have 100,000 plus registered newspapers and weeklies. And this conversation, this raging debate around the lexicon to be used, around the English words to be used, was completely untouched in Indian media, either in 2015 or in 2016. That pretty much shows the insularity of Indian media. And like, just to steal a phrase that Sudarshan was saying in his opening remarks, we cannot be a permanent member in the Security Council and ask a seat in the, at the table with the big boys by just piling up arsenal, piling up killing machines, and demanding, oh, let us in, let us in for our numbers. You cannot use your massive 1.3 billion number as a number of exceptionalism and not show any humanity, any international leadership, any international solidarity, any morality in terms of tilting the debate. And Indian mainstream media's insularity is actually a marker of that complete lack of humanity, complete la lack of engagement in a raging crisis in the world and being completely, you know, this obsessive navel gazing and insularity to everything border and I, not even border. Ravish Kumar wrote an article for me five years ago. Actually, Daryl DeMonte was writing an article. Have you, how many of you have read this brilliant cover story New Yorker did on how Times of India changed journalism forever? It's called Citizen Jane. It's a take on Citizen Kane. You've read it? So Ken Oletta, Ken Oletta did that long form piece. So New Yorker is known for long form journalism, one of the best. Now the same guy who set it up in Caravan, Jonathan Shanin, has gone to Guardian to start new Guardian long reads. So Citizen Jane, which is a cheeky take on Citizen Kane, is about how the Jane brothers ruined Indian journalism forever. And uh, uh, Daryl De Montes, one of the editors who had resigned along with Dilipad Gaonkar when this whole debacle happened in the Bennett and Coleman house. And Daryl De Monte edited a book where Ravish wrote a chapter because, again, this is the language barrier. Ravish is a Hindi journalist, and Daryl is an in primarily an English godfather <coughs> of environmental journalism. So I had to be the mediator to get Ravish to write this particular chapter. So he says, I think it's a bit hyperbole, but it sort of strikes it at the heart. He says that 70% of Indian media resources is dedicated to a five kilometer radius from Ashoka Road to Parliament, North Block, South Block, and Krishna Menon Mark. So that is the kind of obsession. It's not even Delhi. It's not even North India. It's exactly five kilometer radius. That's where you have all the Obi Wan. That's where you have all the journalists doing their piece to camera. That's where you have journalists hyperventilating. So if you have your world view, your world of concern, your universe is so shrunken. No wonder your heart shrink. No wonder you are setting a narrative to get your borders to start shrinking in also, right? So this is exactly what you, you see, the playbook happening. Um, and the other thing that we see in India happening is the MSMNSization of mainstream media. So Maharashtra Navnirman Shena, the way they beat up the Biharis and the UPIs in Bombay because they think they're stealing jobs. Is you see the same kind of rhetoric being repeated about Rohingyas in the mainstream media. So it's almost like when the fringe becomes the mainstream and the toxicity, the, the hate of the fringe becomes the mainstream conversation. So we'll come to the um, Rohingya crisis and how the Indian media showed its true colors also. But before that, I want to go um, uh, chronologically. 
So the next thing that happened after this whole entire debate of Barry Malone and Al Jazeera and the entire world jumping in to talk about debates, we also had something very toxic that is Theresa May used the word swarms. You've heard of locust swarms coming and completely destroying crops. Think of human beings with families making desperate journeys, trying to actually escape death and think of the English word swarms being used for them. This is a woman, this is a world leader. No wonder her own party is unraveling. The second term that was used is by this cocky um, then British Prime Minister, David Cameron. He used a word called marauding migrants. Now these are world leaders using English words, marauding migrants, okay? The third was, of course, um, Le Pen. I, I, I don't even want to get into what Le Pen and Trump have used in terms of the complete uh, hate mongering and the kind of toxic English words that they have put. But the point is, we have to give credit to some of the international media, for example, Guardian and Independent, because they called out how wrong it was on the part of, let's say, a Theresa May or a um, David Cameron to use those kind of English words like swarms and marauding migrants. You do not see that in Indian media. I mean, I, I would like to believe I'm an accomplished media critique and commentator. I am so good that I can pretend to be a journalist and actually win a journalism fellowship without being a journalist. So I presume the fact that we are not calling out the MNSization in the Republic TV, the India TVs of the world, or the uh, ZTV and the Times Now shows a lack of moral courage, a lack of spine, that we are not calling out either uh, elected leaders using that kind of words or our mainstream media using those kind of phrases, which leaves a lot to be desired. You can't just be claiming to be the largest democracy if your actions do not fall within the remit of humanity and democracy or fraternity to begin. I think fraternity is a massively important value and that's a value that we keep failing over and over and over again. So what happened last year in the first ever conference in the UN refugee crisis and uh, UN conference on refugees and migrants? 193 countries, so right now they say about 203 countries are there, but 193 have got UN recognition. All of them attended. Uh, $4.5 billion was pledged, like I said. Um, The, there was the pious words that how this is the biggest crisis and needs to be, uh, there needs to be much more global solidarity and this is within no country's power to actually handle or respond to it, which is great. But what did not happen, and Barack Obama also, I think, retrospective, uh, retrospectively needed to justify and legitimize a Nobel Peace Prize, which he had got exactly a year after he took office. There was nothing to show Guantanamo was still there. Um, the Palestine crisis was still burning. Middle, uh, middle, West Asia, not Middle East, they're not Middle East to us, they're West Asia to us. West Asia was still burning, and of course, the 2014 massive bombing happened, and Sudarshan did not say something, one of my most trending and trolled pieces ever is when I wrote a piece about how Indian Indian citizens are complicit in the uh, killing of Palestinian children because we are the second biggest arms buyer from Israel. So when the bombing of children and women happen, then we basically bankrolling, co-financing that genocide. And I've been nicely trolled with all kinds of sexist remarks on that, but I'm supremely proud of that piece of Mm, uh, that, that particular article. So 193 countries came in the 2016 first ever summit. $4.5 billion were uh, pledged. But look at the hypocrisy about how the pledgings happened. Teresa May pledged $100 million. She gave a speech. So this is when, you know, when that, that exasperated English phrase, don't you have any shame? You feel like saying that when you listen to some of the speeches. So Teresa May gave $100 million. She said, we have shown leadership. Do you know what that $100 million was specifically meant for? It was specifically meant for stopping North African Maghreb refugees from reaching British shores. She was pledging in a refugee conference money to not let refugees reach her borders, right? 
while she was giving this speech 600 children were waiting in the french side of english channel 600 unaccompanied minors were waiting in the Kalai port to be reunited with their families in the Dover port. So English Channel, the British side is Dover port, the French side is Kalai port. And she was making a statement, a global speech about how they have always shown leadership, how they have always lived up to their responsibility as a global leader, and how they, here there's $100 million of small change, please keep it. But not exactly why we are giving you that money and what exactly it is meant for and how we are continuing to violate every shred of humanity by continuing to separate unaccompanied minors from their families and we're continuing to stop refugees from even reaching our borders. The European deal with Turkey is another shameless example of the same thing. So when European Union gave $2 billion as development aid to Turkey, what they basically said is, can you please take all the 1.8 million refugees from North Africa. Oh, by the way, you know, we bombed them, the NATO bombed them, we destabilized a really stable part of the world and we completely created shit, and which is why refugees are coming from there. But can you please take this $2 billion and please don't let any of them reach our borders. So they outsourced border control to Turkey. John comes from Japan. Japan gave a billion dollars to the UN High Commission for Refugees. This is a country where there is an aging population, where 78% of the land is still forested. It needs migrants because it doesn't, the average age is really, it has, it has crossed stabilization of population, so their population growth rate is less than their aging rate. So it is a very aging population that need migrant workers. They're not taking refugees or migrants. And the year that they wrote a $1 billion check to UN High Commission of Refugees, they took exactly seven, seven refugees in. Sweden and Scandinavia, the lodestar of progressive global policies, right? Whenever it is about progressive social policy, human development index, free press freedom index, the toppers boringly, boringly, predictably, the toppers are always Sweden and Scandinavian countries. They do not take refugees. So this is the level of hypocrisy that we see over and over and over again, which is why that inequality of six countries with 57% of the global wealth taking exactly less than 9% of the refugees and six countries with less than 2% of the global wealth taking 51% of the refugees becomes so much more important to call out the hypocrisy, to call out the cognitive dissonance. And it becomes even worse when you remember that those six countries, at least US, Germany, uh, France, uh, UK, are members of the NATO, which has constantly bombarded some of the most stable parts of the world and created instability and created the refugee crisis. So I think a historical treatment of the refugee crisis is also a disservice. Whenever we talk about the refugee crisis, it's important to talk about why the Syrian war is happening six years, still raging on. Who are the parties? What is their vested interest? Why does North Africa, Maghreb region, which had human development indicators way better than South Asia, still having the kind of refugee outflux that it is seeing? Why is AFPAC so destabilized? Who destabilized AFPAC? And why is AFPAC the second largest uh, hotbed uh, out source point of refugees? Or why is currently, as so Professor Sudarshan said, Rakhine is becoming the latest um, uh, hotbed, or even Somalia. Not many people know that it is the African Union's defense forces, again bankrolled by the Israeli defense force, bankrolled and trained by Israeli defense force, which in the name of fighting Al-Shabaab in East Africa is also creating the, the kind of instability in Eritrea and Somalia and creating the kind of outflux that it is. So I think it's really important every time we have a refugee conversation, we have to have it located on global history, on geopolitics, and talk about vested agenda also. And no party comes out clean. Um, you know, um, when the uh, in Bihar there was this caste killing in uh, called the Lakshman Purbathe massacre, and two years ago, after about 19 years of trial. Everybody from Ranveer Sena got an acquittal. So when um, 
Ram Jetmalani was asked to react, respond to that particular judgment. He said, this is one case where nobody comes out looking good. Absolutely nobody. The Ranveer Sena, the judiciary, the complicit government of then Lalu Prasad government, nobody comes out. Everybody has failed the Dalit families and the the, the, the victims of that massacre in Lakshmanpur Bathe. So currently, when you look at the global refugee crisis, nobody comes out looking good at all, absolutely nobody, especially when you look at it from historical perspective with the source point, the generation, and the vested agenda and all of that. Now let's talk about India. So that was the global scenario from 2015 till now, why I got interested, the lexicon, the wordplay, the head mongering, the MNization of the MNS, the Maharashtra of Nirman Senaization of the uh, public discourse and the play to pledge summit of Barack Obama, his um, swan song before he stepped down from the global geopolitics conversation. So in India, right now we have about 231,000 plus refugees from various origins, Tibetans, Tamils, Chakmas, Hajongs. You know the Hajongs and Chakmas are being given citizenship as per the 2015 Supreme Court judgment this, this year only. So Hajjongs are mostly Hindus, Chakmas are Buddhists, um, then the Hindus from Pakistan, of course. So most of them actually come from uh, South Asia, but then we've also got from East Africa, we've got a few Somalians, we've got a few um, Eritreans, and we've got a few uh, uh, people from the West Asia also. Bangladeshis, um, the two most uh, um, high-profile refugees that we've accepted, and we've made a lot of song and dance about it, practically Netflix series shows about them, is the Dalai Lama, when the Tibetans came in 1951, and now Brahmudga Bukti, the Baloch leader, that um, for whatever geopolitical reason, our prime minister offered a refugee asylum to. Yeah? But going back to Sudarshan's opening remark, we do not have a comprehensive refugee law. We are right now, um, uh, our, our actions are basically determined by two colonial uh, laws. One is the 1939 Registration Act, which is applicable to all foreigners entering the country. And then we also have a 1946 Foreigners Act. After that, we had Passport Act in 1961 and 67, but they are nothing but a bit of rehashing of the 39 and 46 Act. So it's not just CRPC, it's not just the Criminal Procedure Court, which is colonial, which has a 1980-57 mutiny and the, uh, the full force of a colonial government's uh, uh, vendetta in its uh, uh, codification. We also see similar lethargy in not rewriting fit for purpose, that's a very important word, fit for purpose laws in the case of refugees and migrants also. What we have is the Foreigners Registration Regional Office, FRRO. The other thing is the UNHCR, UN High Commission for Refugees Office in Vasant Vihar area, which is both for India and South Asia, which does a lot of processing. When they do the paperwork and processing and they clear someone for asylum, then more or less the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Ministry of External Affairs and the FRRO office does follow suit. But not having a comprehensive refugee law, leaving so much to interpretation, leaving so much to ambivalence, leaves, gives too much of power to the babu, the clerk at the window because it leaves practically everything to discretion. I don't like your face, I will not give you a refugee status. Uh, my prime minister wants to rake up uh, fish in troubled water in Balochistan. He'll offer a refugee status to Brahmat Gamukti. I do not see any uh, geopolitical gains in giving refugee status or uh, deporting 40,000 Rohingyas. I'll do that. Because we do not have a law, when you do not have, I think in the bane of Indian legislation has been two things. One is inexact definition, inexact wording, which is on purpose rather than happenstance. It is not coincidence, but on purpose, because Indian civil service trained by the colonial masters has always wanted an escape route, an exit clause, and having inexact terms, having uh, ambivalent words, which should have no place in law is one of the best way to have an exit clause for yourself. 
and that we see over and over and over again after 70 years of independence after a teflon coated democracy and our ambition to have a seat in the with the big boys in the permanent council the other thing is the 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 um, international covenants that we've been signatories to the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. India is the only liberal democracy, large democracy, which has not ratified the 1951 Refugee Con Convention. We have not ratified the 1967 Protocol on Status of Refugees. We have not ratified the 1954 UN Convention on Statelessness or the US 1961 UN Convention on Reduction of Statelessness. But we have ratified U UDHR, we have ratified the 1966 in International Covenant on um, uh, Civil and Political Rights, we have ratified CEDAW, we have ratified Convention Against Torture, we have ratified uh, the 2016 New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants. So all of this still gives a lot of handle to human rights lawyers, to humanitarians, to challenge that kind of <coughs> knee-jerk, vilification, mass deportation uh, decisions whenever that comes to a pass. Um, other than that, the, the other two, you cannot take them. And why is this important to challenge this current uh, Rohingya conversation? Is other than the kind of, I mean, um, News Laundry has put out a video clip. I, do, I, I, I would imagine you can get it in YouTube channel. But if you just do a Google on Hindi media discourse and refugee, you will get, you know, Ekta Kapoor serials will suddenly sound progressive the kind of Hindi news media portrayal of Rohingyas that we have witnessed in the last one month, two months, yeah? In the second fortnight of, just two weeks, in the second fortnight of September, it is reported by the UN High Commission for Refugees that 123,000 Rohingyas uh, deserted Rakhine because there was a scorch earth policy by the Myanmar's army and the kind of burning, the kind of absolute torching of Rakhine, the habitations of Rohingyas that happened over there. So the Buddhist government over there, and I think uh, the way um, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, so you know the Nobel Peace Prize is, is a bit of a joke when you see someone like Henry Kissinger getting it, someone like Barack Obama getting it in the second year of his office, or someone like Aung San Suu Kyi getting it, and then her complete, complicit silence in what is happening with the Rohingyas and the, in the Rakhine state and her army. So those are things, they get aggravated in our country, and we are only waking up to this now, but in 2015, again, there was a boatload of Rohingyas who were intercepted by the Coast Guard in the Andaman Nicobar Island. They were fed, they were clothed, and again, they were put back in the dinghies and they were put in the deep end of the sea. So this is absolute violation of non refoulement treaty, which is about you cannot put, see, the, the principle, it's like Hippocratic Oath. International development is a lot like Hippocratic Oath. Hippocratic Oath is do no harm. Knowingly do no harm, unknowingly do no harm. International development is a lot like that, do no harm. So harebrained policies, intercepting people who are going to be dying or sinking in the deep end of the sea, clothing them, feeding them, and putting them back in the dinghies is nothing but refoulement because you are again doing them harm. You're putting them into absolute desperation, into sheer short death, either death by the elements of the nature or by a very repressive government and repressive regime. And that we see over and over again. So I think the two responses as a country displaying solidarity country celebrating democracy and country with a shred of moral fiber would be A, to challenge Rohingya, the Myanmar's government's action at the UN and every single uh, regional and international forum. And secondly, the 40,000 people who are in India who have absolutely no shred of evidence that there is criminal or terrorization or Islamic fundamentalism going on to let them stay. I mean, uh, two of my juniors went to see them in the uh, Bastis, in the uh, the settlement colonies, in, in not even settlement colonies, the, the, in, in uh, near Sarita Vihar, and the kind of subhuman conditions in which they live. 
to think that any one of us even desires that kind of a life and to say that no they need to be deported and deported to sheer short death shows there's something really remiss in our public policy really remiss in our public discourse and one of the biggest complicit player colluding in this has been the mainstream english and partly in sorry mainstream hindi and partly english media is by fomenting this othering fomenting the alienation fomenting this hate mongering clubbing everybody and general generalizing them as terrorists and islamic fundamentalists rather than actually going and examining their living condition so ravish did a series a deep dive on the conditions in which the hindu pakistan refugees stay in india in rajasthan they are as subhuman so to play this hyper nationalist hindutva card and to pr- practically also abandon the people you've given refugee status even in country and to then privilege one set of refugees over another I mean, this is like you know this is when you know it's the end of the days have you no shame left this is all moral fibers being abandoned for every which way in geopolitics and international and national statesmanship that we see over and over again so yeah what is the time Okay. We have time for discussion. Okay. So, uh, in terms of violations, according to Fali Nariman, there's the violation of the four, Article 14, 21, and 32. All the international instruments that I just listed. Um, there, is, there are three private members' bills which were brought in by Sashi Tharoor, Varun Gandhi. So, see, these are completely multi-partisan. Okay. Ravindra Jena from BJD, Sashi Tharoor from Congress, and Varun Gandhi. That we need to have a comprehensive refugee law, but they are yet to see the light of day. And if you know anything about the parliamentary proceeding, a private member bill, if not debated in that particular session, gets killed. The Indian Citizenship Amendment Act, which has been furthered by the current government and is under consideration by the joint parliamentary committee is actually privileging hindu refugees over everybody else hindu immigrants over everybody else so we have seen the failure of moral fiber humanity and fraternity principles over and over again and now the latest um, uh, uh, dog whistle of uh, deporting mass deportation so the next day like i said to watch out for is obviously um, 21st of november when the uh, court will start a detailed hearing uh, why should we also care for three more reasons number one when the climate change that is striking us will have massive amount of climate refugees we need international solidarity and the hotbed will be south asia so if we are not living up to our roles now if we are not showing international solidarity now chances are very bright when we are in the throes of it we will also not face international solidarity that's number one number two we are the biggest recipient of remittance economy please remember development finance in india is not financed by professors doctors or white collar workers but by blue collar workers living in subhuman conditions most of them in west asia being the biggest recipient of remittance economy in the country so next time you do come across a blue collar worker from west asia be very 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 respectful they are probably bank rolling a lot of your 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 uh, life uh, public services right so it's really important that we start at least showing some leadership in humanizing the lives living and working conditions of migrant workers across the world and not high net worth individuals and professionals in super salary category but serious blue collar workers and desperate migrants because we are source point for many of them that's one of the reasons also why we should care uh we should also care is because one of the abject failure of uh, the 2016 summit at UN has been complete silence on international internal displacement last year we had 302 districts being declared droughted out of 630 districts we have seen swarms of migration we have seen a construction sector which was supposed to be a sunshine sector unable to absorb the migrant labor outflow from the agrarian sector so we will have internal chaos we will have internal instability which is why it's important to be empathetic and humane so it's not just reclaiming empathy in the case of students as we saw in ryan international case but in empath- em- reclaiming empathy in public discourse in narrative building and i think it's really important because students are at our learning institutions uh, dedicated to critical thinking are at the forefront of it 
The other thing is we there is complete silence on un unaccompanied minors also. Since I've just won a fellowship on child development and determinant sectors of child development, if we claim to be saying that the youngest youthful nation in the world, I think it's very important for us to start looking at the conditions, the global conditions in which children are born and raised and the kind of suffering and injustices they are subjected to for no fault of theirs. And unaccompanied minors being holed up and detained in Lampedusa, Nauru, PNG is one of those classic manifestations of it, which is why right now we are at a pass where silence would be complicit with hate-mongering narrative building, which is why they should not be silenced. So in conclusion, um, how many, uh, I would, this is a bit cliche, but I think it's really important to keep saying it over and over again. Pastor Nemola, the Lutheran priest who called out the hypocrisy of German intellectuals before the Second World War, I think it's the best way to keep on remembering him in the kind of fraught times we are living in, not just nationally, but globally. He had written, first they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. You can replace these words with ethnic minority identity, with ethnic majority identity, with blue collar identity, with white collar identity, but the logic and the importance, the call out for international solidarity will still hold, which is the fact, if you are scared that there would be nobody left to speak for me, it's important that we start speaking out for everybody else, especially the persecuted human beings. That's number one. Number two, my favorite quote, Bertrand Russell, mathematician and philosopher said, man is a man or woman or transgender, is a credulous animal. In the abs because believe he must. In the absence of good grounds, he'll believe on bad grounds. And I think what Indian mainstream media right now is doing, what Indian public discourse is doing, is nothing but festering and producing bad grounds. So as a elite institution, wanting wannabe institute of eminence, <laughs> dedicated to critical thinking, I think it's wanton upon you to question, fact check, call out and build bad grounds. Do not let good, bad grounds, sorry, build good grounds and do not let bad grounds pass without questioning. Thank you.